Jesus is someone who I can always rely on and someone who never judges me. He is very much my walk and the guidelines for my life. Jesus is the one who saved my life uh, from the deepest pit I think thought I would ever be in to the highest mountaintop that I had ever been on. Jesus is my all in all. Jesus is my savior. He's the, uh, he's the reason that I live. Uh, he's the only reason that I live. Without him, I would have nothing. Uh, wouldn't even have the air that I breathe. He's, um, he's my life, my love, and reason for everything. The 90s were a while ago now, and so when I say who grew up in the 90s, I have some people that don't raise their hands because they were born in like 2000, which baffles me because it makes me feel old. Uh, I was out uh, hunting yesterday, and, and somebody asked me, you know, uh, how old are you? And they thought I was like 32. I'm almost 38, and so I'm a little bit older than what I seem. And uh, it, it's kind of crazy when you get me to think about it, but I grew up in the 90s, and I'm, I'm wondering who else was like around in the 90s. Okay, we got a few people around in the 90s. Yeah, there used to be this cartoon, maybe you remember it, called Prince Valiant. I'm not, I'm not sure if anybody remembers that cartoon. Um, it was the story of a young prince who, after the fall of his kingdom of Thule, became infatuated with another kingdom. You might remember this kingdom. It's a legendary kingdom that they make movies and all kinds of things about. It's the kingdom of Camelot. Right, the legendary kingdom first written about by Geoffrey of Monmouth back in the 12th century. And, and this, this young Prince Valiant, he fell in love with Camelot. And, and the purpose it gave him to pursue things like uh, justice and truth and, and honor and, and friendship. And while I was first exposed to the story of Prince Valiant in this cartoon in the early 90s, it actually first debuted in a comic strip created by Hal Foster back in 1937. Anybody ever read that comic strip, Prince Valiant? No? Oh, okay, we got a couple, all right. That's exciting. And, and so for years and years, people, including myself, people born before me, have been hearing the tales and adventure of King Arthur and his knights, of Lancelot and Guinevere, of Mordred and Merlin, and they've been in books and, and pictured in TV shows and, and in comic strips and from movies to, to Disney to Warner Brothers. We have all heard these legends and tales about this boy who becomes king because he draws this fabled sword from a stone that proves him worthy to lead this kingdom, to rule this kingdom of Camelot. And while the stories of, of Camelot are fictitious. Sorry if I bursted your bubble. <laughs> while, while, while those stories are fictitious, they do reveal a truth about the human heart. A, a truth that shows us why these legends and tales are so captivating and compelling to us. And that is because we long to be part of something bigger. We long to be part of a story that's bigger than ourselves. We long for worth and value in our lives. We want to know that what we do and how we live really matters. The, the poet, King Solomon, who ruled over Israel from 970 to 930 BCE, put it this way in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He, being God, has set eternity in the hearts of human beings. Meaning we're, we're looking for value. We're looking for something or someone who is truly worthy of ourselves. Something or someone who will last forever. Which kind of brings us to this final conversation I want to talk about in our Who is Jesus series that surrounds the question, is Jesus worthy? That's what we're asking today. Is Jesus worthy? Is he worthy of our life? Is he worthy of our devotion? Is he worthy of our obedience and the whole of our being? And I want to I wanna tackle this question by first fast-forwarding 
all the way to the end of Scripture, the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, where we read the disciple John's vision of Jesus as he peers into the throne room of heaven and ushers in what appears to be events leading to the end of time, leading to his return when both the living and the dead are judged. And he writes, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break open the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And so I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See, the the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. John says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp. They were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. You are worthy. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. John says, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down in worship. Now listen here because it's easy to get lost in all of the questions that we may have about what's going on and all of the imagery that we see in John's descriptions of what is going on in the throne room. And and so rather than getting lost in all of those descriptions, I I would want to summarize basically what we know when we read this passage. Instead of, you know, what does this mean or or what does this mean or what do you think this is going to look like? Let's simply zoom in and focus on what we know in Revelation chapter Number one, we know that the scripture is referring to Jesus because it mentions the Lion of Judah. It mentions the Root of David, the Lamb of God. All prophetic names referring to Jesus. Number two, we know that there is a problem. There is a scroll that needs to be opened in order for things to move forward. And this lamb, this lion, only Jesus can open this scroll. And finally, number three, when Jesus opens the scroll, everyone in the throne room and in heaven and on the earth and under the earth starts singing in some fashion or another about Jesus' worthiness. And so what I want to identify in answering our question, is Jesus worthy, are three reasons we see in this passage for why Jesus is worthy. The first being, Jesus is worthy because he's triumphed. Jesus is worthy because he's triumphed. In what ways has he triumphed? How has Jesus... Well, let's let's go back and look at Matthew chapter 4. 
where we read of Jesus being tempted in the desert by Satan himself. And he tempts Jesus with food as he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He says, Jesus, find your fulfillment in something else besides the Father. Find your fulfillment in something else besides God. And although he has been fasting and he's terribly hungry, Jesus says to Satan, Satan, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then, you know, Scripture tells us, well, Satan, he comes along again. And he says, Jesus, prove to me you are who you really say you are. Prove to me that, that you are the Son of God. If you can do all that you say you can do, let's go to the temple, let's go to the mountain, you jump off. And the Scripture says he'll command himself concerning you, and angels are going to come down so that you're not going to strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, it's written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Well, Satan comes along again. And he shows him in a vision all the power and the glory of the kingdoms of the world and, and says, Jesus, all, the, all this I'm going to give you if you just bow down and worship me. And again, Jesus says, Satan, it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And time and time again, Jesus overcame temptation when there was a shortcut, when there was an easy way out. Jesus overcame temptation, triumphed over temptation, triumphed over disease, triumphed over sickness and blindness and demons and dangerous life-threatening situations, delivering person after person after person of all these effects of living in a fallen and broken world. He triumphed over them, rescued people from them until they nailed him to a cross buried him in a tomb, and then he conquered that too. Jesus is worthy because he's triumphed. Jesus is worthy because he's overcome. He's done what no other person in history has done or ever will be able to do again. Reminds me of, uh, of the, the father who came to Jesus with his young boy. And, and he was asking Jesus for help. And he said, Jesus, here's my boy. It's, it's got a demon in him that causes him to convulse and have seizures. And every time we go by the water or by the fire, this thing seizes him. He goes into convulsions, and it tries to throw him in the fire to, to kill him. It tries to throw him in the water to drown him. And Jesus, I took him to your disciples, and they could not free him from it. They could not deliver him. And what does Jesus say? Bring the boy me and when jesus speaks that demon's got to flee he runs away he's gone when jesus speaks the boy is healed never bothers him again and then all the disciples start to gather around jesus why couldn't we do it why couldn't we heal this boy why couldn't we drive the demon out jesus and jesus says to them this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. There's a truth in there. We want to triumph. We got to be hungry for Jesus. We got to be thirsty for more of Jesus. We want the presence of God to fill our life so completely because we recognize that he is the only one that can triumph. Last Thursday night was just a taste of that. Only the beginning. We're going to press forward with another prayer and fasting night in January because we want to be hungry for Jesus. We want to be hungry for the the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life because there are things in our lives that need to be conquered, that need to be overcome, that need to be dealt with, demons that need to be dealt with. And they're not going to be overcome, but for Jesus. It's, It's not going to happen on our own because only Jesus is worthy. Only he can open the seals and usher in the kingdom of God. He's the only one capable of dealing with our bitterness. He's the only one capable of dealing with our unforgiveness. He's the one that's capable of dealing with our addiction. He's the one that deals with our insecurity. 
He's the one that refreshes our lives and restores our families and transforms us and makes things right. Friends, we we don't need a new ideology. We don't need a new religion. We don't need a new leader or political party or president. What we need is more Jesus. That's what we need. Because only Jesus is worthy, and only Jesus has triumphed. What are you struggling with that needs to be overcome, that needs to be triumphed over? Bring it to Jesus. Position yourself in His presence. Get hungry for Jesus. And if you don't know how to do that, man, I'd love to have a conversation. I'd love to have a phone call. I'd love to sit down over a cup of coffee or breakfast or lunch because there is nothing like sitting in the presence of Jesus. And I would love to share with us how we can do that. Jesus is worthy because he has triumphed. But look at, look at verse 6 where John, he says again, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. If you recall, this is similar to the phrase used by another John. Jesus' cousin, who when he was baptizing people in the Jordan River, Jesus came forward and John's words were, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But now here in John's vision, after he opens up the seals, after he triumphs, the four living creatures and 24 elders fall down and start singing, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood purchased for God members of every tribe and language and people and nation. Referencing Jesus' death again. He's the Lamb of God. And what we note here is Jesus is worthy because he is the embodiment of love. He died for the scope of humanity. Even while we were still rejecting him, even if you are currently still rejecting him, Jesus died for you. He offers us new life. He is God's ultimate expression of love towards us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not die, but have eternal life. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Jesus is your friend. He's the friend of sinners. He's laid his life down for you and for me. And he was able to lay his life down because he's worthy. He's the lamb who was slain. I was just a boy sitting where you are listening to my father preach the first time I heard this story. He and my Uncle Dave were just young boys back then, and they were on a vacation up north in Michigan with my great-grandpa Cy hunting for agates. Agates are a type of rock that when you find them, you can polish them, and they're absolutely brilliant in their magnificent features. And so they would go agate hunting on vacation often with my great-grandpa, and they were on the shores of Lake Superior searching the beach for hours and hours and hours, losing track of time, out in the middle of nowhere, far from the shore, when a thunderstorm blew in, as often does on the shores of Lake Superior. And there was no cover. It came in so fast. The thunder, the lightning, the pelting rain... They couldn't make it to the shoreline. They needed cover, and there was none but for this large piece of driftwood. And my great-grandpa Cy, he took his strong, big plumber's hands, and he began to dig out a hollow underneath that piece of driftwood. When finally that hollow got deep enough and wide enough, he said, come here, boys. The sky getting darker, the thunder getting louder, the rain pelting harder. He says, get down in that hole. And they laid down in that little cleft he had made underneath that piece of driftwood. And then he took his large body and he laid over top of them, shielding them from the noise and the thunder and the pelting rain. All the while assuring them it's going to be okay. 
Don't worry. It's going to be all right as that rain pelted his back. There's nothing like the love of a parent, is there? Like the love of a mother, like the love of a father, like the love of a grandmother, like the love of a grandfather, like the love of our heavenly father expressed in the person of Jesus. And in the same way that we benefited from his love, Jesus, the embodiment of God's love, the only one who is worthy, he calls us to love others. John 15, Jesus says, this is my command, love each other as I have loved you. 1 John chapter 5, like we talked about last week, this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. Think about that statement. Let it sink in. We love God by showing love for others. And we love others by loving God. We love others by loving God. We show love for God and we love others because he's the embodiment of his love. So when I read my Bible, I'm loving the people around me. When I gather with the body of Christ, I'm loving the people around me. When I sing praises to God, I'm loving the people around me. When I get baptized, I'm loving the people around me. When I pray, I'm loving the people around me. When I listen to and obey the Holy Spirit prompting in my life, I'm loving the people around me. When I participate in a connection group, I'm loving the people around me. When I I get involved in kids ministry or in roots, I'm loving the people around me. And we could go on and on with all these ways to show love for God, understanding that when we do, we are loving the people around us by declaring with the four living creatures and the 24 elders in the throne room of God, Jesus is worthy. Look at verse 12. see the voices of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands all surrounding the throne of God and they're chanting worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise and as we look at those words I want to zoom in on on the word wisdom The the Greek word Sophia, meaning broad and full of intelligence, used of the knowledge of very diverse matters. And if you remember, it was Jesus who with his wisdom confounded the religious leaders and the teachers of the law, right? He schooled them in their own matters, such as we read about in John chapter 8, where there was this, this woman who had been caught in adultery and was waiting to be condemned. And the, the religious leaders brought her before Jesus and said, teacher, what should we do? The law of Moses says that, that we, should, we should punish such peaceable people. We should, we should stone them. And they were doing this to trap him. They wanted him to break the law of Moses. And they had probably seen his compassion on, on the vulnerable and, and the destitute and the, and, the, and the preyed upon in the community. At, at which point Jesus bent down and he started writing in the dirt. I think that's very interesting. I wonder what he was writing. Scripture doesn't tell us. But as he wrote in the dirt, they began to pressure him. What should we do, Jesus? The law of Moses says this. Tell us what to do. And Jesus says, let any one of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then slowly, one by one, each person left until it was only her and Jesus. And he looks up and he says, who's left to condemn you? No one, sir. And what does Jesus say? He says, then neither do I. Now go, leave your life of sin. 
suddenly what we understand is that Jesus is worthy because of his wisdom. Because he can do what is just and right every single time. Jesus is worthy because he is just and righteous. And he is just and righteous in every situation, every single time. In middle school, we used to have uh, 15 to 20 minutes after our lunch hour in which we would get to go in the gym and we would play basketball. And so as middle school boys, you know, we would often scarf our food as fast as we could and then go into the gym and there'd be this giant bin of basketballs and we'd get them out and like six hoops would come down from the ceiling and there'd be a game going on at every one of them. Some of it would be knockout. Some of it would be actual basketball games. Some people would just be shooting. And then there would be some people in the middle with volleyballs and they'd be hitting them back and forth. And then when uh, the monitors decided that, hey, it was time to go to class, they'd blow the whistle. All right, everybody bring the balls in. And then like 10, 20 basketballs and volleyballs just all towards the middle being hurled. <laughs> right? And I remember that uh, this happened, and uh, there was one kid who decided one of these basketballs was caught on top of the bleachers that were pushed into the wall, and he decided he was going to scale the bleachers, go up there and get it. And he grabbed that basketball. His name was Eric. And then, and then he chucked it down. And when he chucked it down, I'm, I'm guessing he hit somebody, and they weren't too happy about it because that basketball came flying back up at him, and he dodged it hit the wall, thump, and he did this. <laughs> and all of a sudden, that basketball came flying back. <laughs> and he jumped, and he dodged it. <laughs> he mocked. And then another basketball came flying. And then another person joined in, and now there were three people throwing basketballs at him. And then another one was added, and then there were like six to eight people chucking basketballs at this kid. And suddenly his face goes from mockery and laughter to oh no. And he lays down in the cleft of the bleachers trying to dodge all these balls that are flying out. Finally, the monitor puts a stop to it. All the balls get gathered together. The kids go to class and Eric comes down from the bleachers and he's crying because somebody hit him in the head. And I think to myself, isn't that far too often what happens with people? When we're wronged or, or when we're hurt, we don't want an apology. No, that's, that's not good enough. We want to get even. We got we to gotta settle the score, right? We want to we wanna point our finger and judge others like we see the religious leaders doing here, right? We want to throw a basketball at somebody. Jesus, what she did was wrong. How can you let this stand? She's offended us. She's offended God. She's brought disgrace to her family. She's a mockery, Jesus. What does Jesus do? Guys, we're all mockeries. We've all failed. We've all blown it. We need to get down off our self-righteous soapbox and understand John's words in John 3, 17. John, who knew Jesus best and said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, Jesus, Jesus had a bigger picture. Jesus had a bigger vision than, than just getting even. Than just pronouncing judgment in his wisdom and justice and righteousness he wanted redemption for humanity he wanted wholeness and restoration and healing he came to make things right he came to transform lives and transforms relationships between us and god and us and each other perhaps today that's how we can declare who he is in our lives how we can declare his worthiness to step back and take a look at those relationships in our lives that have been broken. To be willing to humble ourselves before God and seek His wisdom and how we can make things right again. How we can restore and redeem. How He can make amends. And maybe that starts with prayer or praying for the person. Maybe it 
Maybe it means seeking their well-being, or maybe it means apologizing for a role that we've played that caused the breakdown. Is there, is there a rift in your marriage? Is, is there a, a breakdown in a relationship with a coworker or a, or a friend at school? An argument you've had with somebody or a grudge that you've been holding? Bring it to Jesus. Allow Jesus into the situation. Allow his Holy Spirit to speak to you, to trust his wisdom with how to move forward, to act on it because he does what is just and right every single time because he alone is worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. I... I don't know if we're understanding it. He's worthy. Would you say that with me? He's worthy. He's worthy. And he didn't need to pull a sword out of a stone to do it. He didn't need to pick up Thor's hammer to prove that he was worthy. Because he carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. On an old rugged cross. He triumphed. He overcame. And now all of heaven declares his worthiness. Worthy is the Lamb. They're all chanting. Perhaps today we want to join in with that chant. We want to join in with that declaration in Revelation chapter 5 as we look at the throne room of heaven and declare, Worthy is the Lamb. I want to invite us to do that this morning. And we're going to sing and declare that, but I also want to invite us to do that in a unique way next week. We're going to provide an opportunity for baptisms in both our services. We're going to have a little pool set up here, and we've got a baptismal tank up up top. I know one person has already said, I want to be baptized. I want to declare Jesus is worthy with my life. And if you've made that decision to follow Jesus at some point in your life, I want to invite you to join in that declaration of his worthiness by being baptized. And I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. We're somewhere in between. This is a public way to demonstrate what God has done in our life and share with all the people around us, Jesus is worthy. Practical way to love his children and declare his worth in our life. And if you've got questions about baptism and what it's going to look like and and what it means, there's a packet out on the table that you can get. There's a sign-up out on the table. If you're not quite sure and you want to have a conversation, give me a phone call this week. I'd love to chat with you and talk to you more about baptism and, and what it means. But I want to encourage you, listen to the Holy Spirit's prompting. Because He's worthy. He's worthy.